and thank you so much to all of you who have joined us uh, for this special webinar uh, to speak about the role that education plays on helping us maintain our flyways alive. Uh, as you heard, I'm Patricia Sarita. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Chief Executive of Burlap International, and I am delighted to be with four exceptional speakers. Uh, uh, Sarah from our uh, team, uh, but Luisa, Jigme, and Christy from our Burlap partners from uh, Asia and Africa. Um, as I said, uh, this is going to be about talking about education and why are we uh, so interested in making sure that we're bringing children along uh, to help us um, first understand the wonder of the migration, but also um, make sure that they that we cultivate their interest in birds and, and conservation early on so they can continue to be ambassadors and champions of conservation in the long run. As you probably know, uh, our migratory routes are very uh, threatened. Um, we are not making it easy for all of these fantastic birds that are uh, going from south to north and north to south twice a year to try to find a suitable, suitable habitat for uh, breeding or wintering um, and whether it is by collisions or hunting or bad weather, uh, we're not making it easy for them. Uh, so we are celebrating uh, World Migratory Bird Day on Saturday. So please do join us on social media. And if you are a keen birder, join us on the Global Birding Weekend uh, that we will have this weekend. Um, but we're very delighted that you are actually going to uh, join us in this incredible conversation about how does the Burleaf family work uh, with uh, children and education? Um, so let me kick it off to the people who really know about this. Um, and we're gonna bring in uh, Sarah Brady first. Uh, Sarah, um, Sarah's background is on conservation biology uh, and has been working on environmental education since the age of 14. She recently joined the BirdLife team, but she has been very familiar with the BirdLife family, spending over five years working with BirdLife Malta, uh, starting as an education volunteer and then becoming the head of education and engagement in 2020. Uh, we are delighted to have you, Sarah, in our team now. Um, she is um, starting a new role as the partner relations officer, so she's going to be the ambassador of the partnership within the BirdLife team. Um, and uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you. And I will introduce the other speakers as soon as uh, they start presenting. So Sarah, take it on. Welcome everybody. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you for that introduction. So I'm going to start us off here today answering this question. Why is environmental education important for migrating birds? What's the connection between these two different things? Well, first and foremost, migrating birds need our help. On their long journeys, on their migration routes, they may come across many different challenges, some of which are caused by human activity. And this is why it's so important for environmental education and to engage with people in protecting migrating birds. Some of the challenges that they face in their migrating routes are things like lack of habitats. So as birds go along their migration routes, they need to have resting places, places where they can stop to feed and to have shelter, to drink water. But what happens when our habitats become very degraded, uh, when they start to disappear, it becomes very difficult uh, for birds to rest and regain the energy that will enable them to continue on their migration routes. Collisions can also prevent a significant issue because birds find it quite difficult to see the glass um, or even tall sort of man-made objects such as pylons and that can result in a lot of collisions leading to kind of serious injuries. And sadly illegal hunting remains an issue with many birds being, thousands of birds being shot down every migration season. And of course, bad weather can be an issue. Just a storm can be enough to completely disorientate a bird on their migration route. So I think we can all agree that birds migrating have a lot of different challenges, many of which are caused by human activity and they need our help to be able to survive these amazing journeys. So I'm gonna take it back a step and think about what motivates people to protect migrating birds? What are the core factors that would change your behavior to protect migrating birds? 
And to do that, we need to start thinking about the first few years of a child's development from the ages of about zero to five years old. At this age, children are a bit like a sponge. They're, you're, they're drinking in all of the influences around them from their family, the media they're consuming, the places they play, their school, um, and all these things will accumulate to form the foundation of a child's values. And the values are at the core of what defines us as, as humans. So when children have the opportunity at that very young age to spend time in nature and really connect to the environment, they're going to be much more likely to grow up to be adults um, who will protect and appreciate migrating birds. The second motivating factor is connection. And connection really describes the enduring relationship that each of us have to the natural world. And how do you connect to nature? It's not just about being outdoors, it's also about really deeply appreciating the nature around you, using kind of mindfulness techniques and using your senses to really you know, engage with the environment. And the third motivating factor is contact. It's not enough to just do this once or twice a year. You have to connect to nature as much as possible, even once or twice a week, and that might not even be enough. And the reason why these three, these three things are really important for motivating people to protect nature is the stronger our emotions and the deeper the values, the more likely we are to want to protect migrating birds. And this is what environmental education does. It equips people with knowledge, skills and the motivation to be stewards for the environment. And I think no one sums it up better than Sir David Attenborough in that no one will protect what they, care, what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. And that's why environmental education is crucial for protecting migrating birds, because it gives children that opportunity to experience birds in the wild, to understand them, to learn about them, and also to gain those skills in order to protect them. And everyone has a part to play. Every single person can do something to protect migrating birds. You can create new habitats. And there are so many resources online on how to green school grounds, your gardens, or even your windowsill. Every little helps. You can lobby for bird protection, maybe particularly in those countries uh, which are still facing a lot of illegal hunting. You could write to your local politician. You could join a protest or start a petition. You could help stranded and injured birds. It's very common during the migration to find birds that have perhaps collided with something. Maybe they got lost in a storm um, or maybe they've been shot as well. And you, through environmental education, you can understand what to do, to who to call, what to do to protect birds in those situations. And you can also prevent collisions. So this is a lovely campaign that was run by Spring Alive, which you're going to hear more about in this webinar. But Spring Alive ran this campaign to encourage children to create these brightly colored stickers. And they put them all over, you know, bus stops and buildings. And that helped birds to see the glass and it prevented future collisions. So I think there's, and this is just a couple of the things that we can do to protect migrating birds. So I just want to leave you with this thought. Without environmental education, where are future conservationists going to come from? And that's it for me. Thank you. Sarah did speak a little bit about Spring Alive and Louisa Kaboba uh, from our bird life partner in Ghana, the Ghana Wildlife Society, is going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about Louisa. Um, Louisa is the project officer of biodiversity and environmental education at the Ghana Wildlife Society, Birdlife in Ghana. Uh, and she's been with uh, GWS since 2016. She's been, she's been uh, developing and coordinating all of the conservation education programs um, that are part of the, of the partner work in Ghana. And also the activities of junior members, uh, wildlife clubs in schools and developing strategies to sustain the interest of adult and corporate members in wildlife and nature conservation. So without further ado, let me pass it on to Louisa. Um, we're really eager to hear about Spring Alive and it, this is such a fantastic initiative and I absolutely love it. Take it on, Louisa. All right. Um, 
Good morning um, from where I am, and it's a privilege to be part of this webinar. And like Sarah already mentioned, um, migratory birds are very critical and they play key roles in the environment. And there's a need to protect migratory birds. And one of the ways by which we can actually help in conserving or uh, protecting migratory birds and their habitats is to engage our young ones to develop an interest for birds and then nature, and then getting them to take actions for nature. And one of the ways that we do this is through the Spring Alive project, which I'll be talking about shortly. Um, so Spring Alive is um, actually um, a project that gets to kids and it's getting kids together, getting their families, getting teachers um, together to uh, develop their interests for birds and then also get them to take actions for birds. But for, I know most of us may not be uh, environmentalists. So I'll just brief go through something small, like a brief on what birds and migrations are. So um, migrations are usually um, regular movements of um, species. So they could be the mammals, birds, um, we can also have um, some fish migrating regularly from areas of low resources. And over here, when we say low resource, we are talking about areas with insufficient food, insufficient uh, climate for breeding. And when this happens, you find that a lot of species, a lot of migratory species move from these areas of low resources to areas of high resources where they can find enough food to eat and enough food to, to, to nest their young or to, uh, to start breeding. And um, for this particular presentation, I'll be touching more on bird migration. And if you look at bird migration, we have three main bird migration or flyways. So we have the Americans, we have the Africa, Eurasian, and then we have the East Asian, Australian flyway. But for this particular presentation and taking into consideration Spring Alive, we would concentrate on the African Eurasian flyway, which involves migrating of birds from uh, Europe and parts of Asia to Africa. And then before um, I go into details what Spring Alive seeks to achieve, one of the main things that Spring Alive also engages in is getting people, getting our young ones, getting teachers and volunteers to participate in activities that will help to conserve birds. And one of these activities that we know about is the World Migratory Bird Day, which is celebrated on the second Saturday of May and then October every year. So this is actually takes into consideration the fact that uh, when it's May, people in the Northern Hemisphere look out for birds um, that have migrated to the African region. And when it's October, from September to October, that is when people or um, children in Africa also look forward to uh, spring migrants from the Northern Hemisphere. So this is the reason why we have World Migrant Bird Day actually celebrated twice in a year. And um, majority of them migrate to the southern wintry grounds to for conducive environments, like I mentioned earlier. And this year, the, the theme for World Migratory Bird Day is uh, sing, fly, and soar like a bird. So I hope all of us will sing, fly, and take an opportunity to soar like birds. And um, the Spring Alive Project um, is actually um, a citizen science program. So the main activity with Spring Alive is getting people, getting children especially, to gather data on uh, bird species, bird migratory bird species. And it's actually a project that started in 2006. It started in Europe, but uh, with time it moved to Asia. And then by 2010, it had moved down to Africa, getting children in Africa more involved and participating in um, 
uh, migratory bird activities. So it's actually a project that seeks to drive an interest in children it's, uh, for migratory birds and their habitats. It's something that is educational, it is fun. So the core activity of Spring Alive is getting children to track the arrival of uh, spring migrants on the Spring Alive uh, website, which you find on the slide. But apart from this core activity, which involves uh, tracking um, uh, the arrival of spring migrants, there are other activities that partner organizations across the bed life partnership are doing to get our young people to develop and sustain their interest for uh, migratory beds and nature in general. Um, so um, the Spring Alive family is large. So currently we have over 50 uh, partner organizations that are involved in Spring Alive activities. And if you look at the slide, if you don't find uh, your country in the slide, then the next one will actually take you through the steps to get your, your country involved in Spring Alive activities. It doesn't matter if um, you are not part of the Bed Life Partnership, if you are a teacher and you are interested in getting your children to engage in activities of Spring Alive, you are welcome to do that. So um, when you go on the Spring Alive uh, website, which I shared earlier on in the earlier slide, you would find uh, a link where you can register, you can log your first item of spring species, I mean, Spring Alive migrant species. And um, the details are there to help you. It's very simple and everyone can actually just log on to the, the website and register their, their fair sightings of my migratory birds. And uh, uh, we have seven uh, magnificent uh, spring alive species. Uh, these are actually uh, migrant uh, birds that are easily recognizable. You can easily recognize them. They are species that um, um, could easily be identified. And um, we have seven of them. And in the year 2020, that was just last year, uh, before 2020, we had six species. But then uh, after 2017, uh, 2020, sorry, we introduced the common rain clover. That is what we find on the on the slide. So we currently have seven of them, which uh, kids in Africa and kids in Europe and Asia look forward to every year. And it's it's actually an initiative that gets our kids and their teachers to easily identify the beds, take recordings of the bed, learn about the beds, and what threats they are facing. So it's actually a good activity that everyone can, en can enjoy, can involve families and um, get to learn a thing or two about beds. Yes, yeah, so um, one other thing is, um, apart from the fact that um, you are able to record your, your first sightings of beds, of migratory beds on the website, uh, Spring Alive also gives you that opportunity to assess resources that can help in environmental education in schools. So when you go on the website, uh, you can find resources that can help you in environmental education. We have guidelines for teachers. We have uh, games, outdoor games. We have indoor games. We have a lot of um, uh, cards that can help you. So these are a sample of uh, the activities or some of the um, educational materials that you can find on the website that can help you to actually engage your children and develop their interest for not just migratory birds but uh, their habitats as well and getting them to also take action for for birds. So um, we all know the tool that um, COVID-19 had on, 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 on the entire globe. And this is just a snapshot of what we used to do with regards to Spring Alive before uh, COVID-19. So some of the activities where we had the opportunity to go out there without no masks, without social distancing, and we could shake hands and feel free. 
and and it was it was quite interesting. But then uh, with COVID, we had to limit some of these activities. And even though um, uh, COVID nineteen has 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 been uh, a, a setback for some activities, I would like to. Uh, use this platform to appreciate our partners who have been very innovative during COVID. And even though the theme for last year, which was how to be a good better, was, was, was welcome with a lot of enthusiasm and outdoor activities, we had to um, get more innovative and come out with strategies and activities that could be undertaken uh, indoor. So uh, we have um, games, which we call the chasing migration. We also, prior to when, 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 we, when we had the restrictions on um, social distancing and going out and traveling, one thing, the one key activity that uh, the Spring Alive Partnership engaged in to get uh, partners more uh, aware and to enhance their skills was to uh, was through a workshop where we share we share tips on how to use social media, how to use um, digital medium to actually uh, get the spring alive message across. Since it was one of the most engaged uh, platform during the, lock, the the lockdown, so um, even though the, uh, we had lockdown, we were able to produce flyers. We were able to carry out presentations with school children digitally. We also engaged in um, uh, online quizzes, which were actually um, virtual. We were able to carry out um, essay competitions, drawing competitions, and Bed Life also provided simple crafts to get children to actually um, go out there, stay at home, and then um, design um, uh, feeders and to also observe bears from home. So when you go on the websites um, of these partner organizations, you'll find out all the, the digital activities that were carried on, even though we had uh, COVID during the season and uh, we are still in, in COVID. And even though the restrictions have been eased, uh, it's not like it used to be. So you also find some of the innovative activities that partners were uh, engaged in. So how you can stop bears from hitting your window, which Sarah already discussed, how to be innovative with bird feeders, uh, which uh, was uh, shared with our partners from Uzbekistan and then Nigeria, uh, where they had virtual tours uh, in terms of bird watching, they also organized quiz competitions and then they shared migratory bird videos. And then South Africa um, was very innovative in coming up with a fact sheet where it actually tells you, uh, gives you a brief on the spring alive species, how to identify them and how to actually take action for them. And um, there were a lot more activities that were carried out um, during the lockdown. And if you are interested in getting to know more, if you are interested in adopting some of these activities, you can just log on, uh, visit Facebook, and then you can go to the Spring Alive um, page, and then you can find all the activities that were carried out during the lockdown. And uh, the key highlights of uh, last year's outcome was that despite the fact that um, there were a lot of restrictions and it was a, a big setback, um, Spring Alive still um, was successful, I would say. It was, it was really massive where we had over 100,000 children and teachers uh, involved in Spring Alive during the lockdown. We had uh, media coverage that reached more than 7 million people. And then we had appearances on social media, uh, Facebook channel fan or following also increased and our volunteers also increased in number. And then we had a lot more members joining the partners for uh, some of these activities, especially the virtual bed walks. And one uh, key um, impact of uh, Spring Alive for migratory beds is that it's, it's, 
it's actually an avenue to get our young people to develop an interest for nature and not just our young people but it also gets people to be more concerned about migratory birds getting um, um, our adults and getting government to be more passionate about uh, the threats that migratory birds are facing and then it gives you the opportunity to actually uh, identify these threats and uh, actions that you can take as an individual to limit these threats and aside these things, um, uh, Spring Alive is also a great opportunity since one of the core activities is to go out there and, 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 and identify bear species and record bear species. It's also a good avenue to improve your health because it's, 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 it's quite engaging. You have to do some walking. And it's also a great way to connect all of us together globally from Europe through to Asia and then Africa. So uh, Spring Alive is actually a, a very educative program. It's, it's something that the kids love. It's something that the kids are learning from. And it's something that uh, we can expand to every country if, if, if we get people really interested in Spring Alive. And I, I would like to use this opportunity to acknowledge all uh, contributing partners, especially Bird Life International, that spears head this, and um, Hedenberg Cement Group, which is um, providing uh, funding for Spring Alive, the Spring Alive project, and the Bird Life Partner in uh, Poland, Otto, which organizes Spring Alive, and um, all the partners which have made it possible through COVID, even before COVID, who have dedicated their time all the teachers, especially our school children, who have been passionate and are still passionate to learn so much about birds and how they can take actions to protect these birds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louisa. And as you say, the big winners here are the birds, thanks to the children. And um, it is such a fantastic initiative of Berlet. I've absolutely loved Spring Alive. It has brought together uh 500 over 500 schools uh with more than 12 languages just showcasing how nature is the common exactly. so thanks for that and thanks for your spectacular work um and thank thanks for sharing it with everybody um so we're going to move to asia now and i'm going to quickly introduce jig measuring uh from uh the royal society for the protection of nature in bhutan birdlife partner in bhutan uh, where uh, Jigme has been coordinating the Black Neck Crane Conservation Program. Um, he's an economist like I am <laughs> and working in conservation like me. Uh, but uh, Jigme has been working very closely with uh, the Black Neck, Neck Cranes in uh, the Poshibika Conservation Area. That is the largest <laughs> habitat. <laughs> the largest Jenny Habitat of Black Neck Crane in Bhutan. Um, so, Jigme, tell us about all of these extraordinary birds in Asia and what you have been doing with RSBN in Bhutan. Thank you, Patricia, for a wonderful introduction. Um, so, yeah, uh, greetings from Bhutan. Uh, it's uh, evening here in Bhutan. Uh, as introduced, I'm Jigme and uh, I work at RSBN. So today I'll be talking about uh, RSBN's environmental education and advocacy program for change. Um, and uh, as Patricia mentioned, RSBN is a proud partner uh, of uh, BirdLife International since uh, 2016. So before I dive into uh, today's topic, uh, if I may quickly, you know, uh, give a brief background of uh, Bhutan, uh, considering this uh, webinar to be. Uh, a global one, and we have people joining from different corners of the world. So that's where we are, a small dot on the map uh, between two giant countries, uh, China to the north and uh, India on the other three, three sides. We uh, consider ourselves uh, lucky uh, to be, you know, uh, have the kind guidance of our leaders uh, who have a clear and far-sighted vision and so that's why Bhutan today is uh, known to have one of the greenest uh, uh, 
national acts and policies which helps in safeguarding our environment and share equitably the natural resources. So at a glance, uh, Bhutan occupies uh, just about 0. Uh, 0 0.03 percent of the global land surface, uh, but uh, we are uh, proud to host uh, about 1 percent of the global uh, biodiversity. And we have around uh, 11,000 species of uh, biodiversity. Uh, and then every now and then there's a new species being uh, discovered or cited and uh, making Bhutan more attractive for the nature lovers or the bird lovers. Um, and again, if I may again take a, a short time to uh, talk about RSP and who we are. Uh, well, RSPN began uh, uh, in 1987 with the humble uh, beginning of uh, just monitoring this uh, beautiful uh, bird, the black neck cranes, uh, keeping the records of the number of cranes uh, arriving in the country. And uh, in terms of our uh, conservation, uh, we began our conservation from this beautiful valley called Popjika Valley, uh, located in the central west uh, of Bhutan, uh, where we have the highest number of uh, migrating uh, black neck cranes. Last year, we last winter we counted uh, around 440 out of uh, about uh, 550 black neck cranes uh, sighted in the in the country. Uh, anyway, uh, now RSVN uh, uh, has widened its focus and uh, areas, becoming one of the major partners of the royal government of Bhutan in the conservation of uh, the kingdom's natural heritage. The group that you see here is RSPN's uh, Conservation Mandala. Uh, the vision of the organization is to create an environmentally sustainable society. And uh, the outer circle, uh, the four uh, points that you see is our, our uh, uh, focus or the strength that we use to implement our uh, uh, activities. Uh, and right now we are uh, focusing on and have been working on two species of birds the uh, black neck cranes, of course, and uh, uh, the critically endangered uh, white-bellied herons. But uh, today I'm going to talk uh, about environmental education and advocacy uh, program. So uh, Sarah has shared about uh, why we need uh, environmental education uh, in general, and uh, why I'll be talking about why we need environmental education in Bhutan. So of course in Bhutan, like uh, we have uh, respect like in any other uh, countries, uh, we have been living harmoniously with uh, the nature and respecting all forms of life. However, uh, this way of life is changing uh, with modern development. The aspirations are changing, especially of the young ones who have uh, information access to all kinds of uh, modern offerings or global you know, offerings. So therefore to foster a shared community uh, conservation responsibility, and change uh, the mindsets of the people, especially the young ones, towards environment and uh, turn that into actions. Uh, we consider environmental education as an important uh, a tool uh, at, our, uh, at RSPN. Um, we uh, develop uh, uh, various, uh, develop and integrate uh, environmental education programs in the formal education systems. Uh, we have been doing that since 1987. Uh, in fact, uh, EE was first uh, introduced in Bhutan through RSBN, uh, so to shape the mindset of our young citizens and engage them. Uh, RSBN, uh, we instituted nature clubs in schools and uh, monastic institutions where they are mostly engaged in uh, keeping their surroundings clean and green and at the same time act as ambassadors uh, of environmental uh, conservation. We also publish uh, handbooks and resource packs, uh, which are integrated uh, into the formal uh, curriculums uh, in the schools, uh, which lets the students go beyond uh, classroom education. So to do that, we use uh, different uh, approaches and uh, platforms, uh, of course, with schools and monastic institutions. At the local level, uh, we form and work with the local conservation support groups uh, who actually implement uh, some of our project activities. This actually helps uh, in garnering their support and uh, participation and also taking ownership of 
the work uh, and, and the environment. We uh, organize environmental education if events with our members as well, uh, like uh, cleaning campaign and uh, taking them to nature excursions. Uh, we occasionally organize uh, uh, stakeholder coordination meetings uh, so as to streamline uh, our actions. Uh, we, at the digital uh, platform through uh, audio uh, visual productions, we uh, produce uh, short videos, uh, environmental education videos, and uh, upload it on our websites and uh, uh, social media pages on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, so please follow us on our uh, Facebook page and subscribe YouTube channel. Uh, right, so through these approaches and uh, 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 platforms that we use, uh, if I may uh, share some of the remarkable achievements that have been uh, made, uh, in terms of environmental education. This uh, uh, facility here is uh, the Black Necrean Visitor Center in, in Pobjika Valley that I talked about earlier. Uh, it's, it was actually a first of its kind in Bhutan to have you know, a visitor center for one single species. Uh, now it has become an education hub uh, whereby we not only talk about you know, the Black Necreans but uh, the environmental in general. So uh, we have uh, kids, students coming for field trips and learning about uh, the birds and uh, the general environment. Uh, we host thousands of uh, international visitors, tourists in this uh, uh, visitor center. Unfortunately, of course, uh, for the last two years now, uh, uh, we didn't have any uh, international uh, tourists, of course, uh, because of the pandemic, but uh, we do have uh, our local you know, domestic uh, visitors uh, coming to the center. We charge uh, a nominal fee, which is uh, which are brought back to the running of the facility. Uh, as a part of environmental education uh, and uh, raising awareness on uh, the conservation of black greens and its habitat, uh, we, uh, along with the International Green Foundation, we initiated this annual Black Necrean Festival back in 1999 in Koptika Valley, where uh, initially it was uh, to raise in, uh, awareness on the Black Necreans, but now it has become an annual, annual event where people look up to and uh, uh, we, we host uh, again thousands of uh, international uh, tourists just for coming for the festival. Unfortunately, last uh, festival we had to organize the event uh, behind closed doors. Uh, we did uh, uh, live stream the festival, which is posted on our Facebook page if you <laughs> want to have a look. Uh, but uh, during the festival, we have uh, young st local students performing the, this beautiful Black Necrean dance in the Black Necrean costumes and uh, local women, men and women, uh, dancing traditional uh, dances and monks uh, performing Marx dances. And uh, it's a very fun-packed uh, uh, yet uh, educational uh, program that we uh, organize annually. Uh, we, you know, uh, through our uh, advocacy uh, programs, we identify important uh, um, habitats for species uh, like uh, black crane uh, habitats and uh, lobby that uh, habitat to be protected or uh, managed. And uh, as in uh, Pobjika Valley, which falls outside of the protected area system, yet it is uh, considered as the important uh, uh, habitat for the black crane's migrating. Uh, black necrins and now it is identified as one of the uh, Ramsar sites uh, in the in the country. Um, uh, I forget or we lobby uh, with the with the government to make it more conducive to the to the birds as well as for the general environment. And uh, one of the uh, achievements that we could uh, uh, achieve was uh, you know laying the like uh, electric cable lines uh, under under underground, and uh, for the black necrins to fly freely, and of course uh, for maintaining the aesthetics of of the the environment. Uh, talking about uh, the way forward, uh, 
we still need to, uh, you know, uh, foster our organization's uh, visibility, and uh, uh, we have uh, plans to. We continue to uh, enhance our stakeholders' capacity uh, so as to empower them uh, uh, to mainstream conservation uh, at all level of the society. Uh, we will continue. Our SPN will continue. Uh, uh, it's a renew, uh, renewed environmental education and advocacy program with the general populace, uh, especially the young ones, and also uh, enhance uh, conservation uh, program policy uh, interface to relate uh, the emerging uh, environmental issues for uh, policy interventions. Uh, so that's uh, the way forward, and uh, I. This is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, answering questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was fantastic, Jimmy. Thank you. Um, and we're going back to Africa again, and uh, this time moving on to Christy. Uh, Christy is part of the BirdLife South Africa team uh, working on the Tourism and Education Center in Walker's Room. Uh, where she's managing both the accommodation and the guide booking uh, along the maintenance of the buildings and the grounds. Um, Chrissy has been working on environmental education initiatives uh, in and around the Walker's Room um, and is supporting three junior bird clubs, as well as an, a number of schools in Southern um, Pum, um, Pumalanga and the Northern KwaZulu Natal. Um, Christy comes from Berlef, South Africa, um, and uh, is part of the Spring Alive uh, International Steering Committee as well. And we're really lucky to have you today with us, Christy. Um, and before I pass it on to you, I just want to remind everybody, we're gonna have a, sec um, a question and answer session after Christy's presentation. So feel free to put your questions on the Q&A uh, box, uh, the chat is disabled. So please put, um, write your questions and answers uh, there. And it's lovely to see so many of you from all corners of the world. Um, I'll come back to the countries that I've seen after Christy has finished. Um, all right, Christy, take it on. Well, thanks so much, Patricia. She said it was quite a, quite a hefty introduction there. Um, so thanks everybody for joining today. Um, I hope thus far you've learned a little bit more about environmental education. I know that Louisa did uh, touch a little bit on how um, COVID, the pandemic has impacted on environmental education practices, but let's maybe dive a little bit deeper into those. Um, so recapping on what Sarah also introduced, environmental education acts as a link between the social and ecological aspects of when we really holistically look at the environment and what we do each and every day in some sort of way impacts on our natural environment, whether that's from the extraction of resources, the production and transportation of goods, um, or anything that we really do on a daily basis. In an ever-changing world, our environmental education practices need to be adaptable and flexible, depending on the scope of the change experienced, as well as the impact on the system responding to this crisis. Resilience and adaptation, as well as transformation, are at the forefront of any and all pro programs. COVID has definitely called for a fundamental change and reshaping of our craft over the last year. If we go back to what environmental education is all about, the foundation is based in learning in, for, and for the environment in context of place and society and emphasizing the experiences in the environment itself. One of the really nice and simple explanations that I often use is um, about going from the head, so learning about your environment, to your heart, creating a care for the environment and to your hand in order to take action for the environment around you. So what has the COVID pandemic meant for environment education? It's definitely been a particularly different time and difficult time for EE practitioners across the globe. Although we employ the concept of flexibility and adaptability in all our programs, 
This pandemic has really pulled the rug from under our feet. Quick thinking had to be done to reinvent our teachings, our courses and programs, and to make the use of e and online applications as to not to lose our audience and the interest in not only our environment, but also our migratory birds. The natural world took on for the most part, a different focus as we worked from an experiential phase to a more passive position, watching the world go by from behind a computer screen. No more could we see the light bulb and aha moments uh, with learners in the field or witness the waking of when skills, knowledge and experiences came together, which ultimately creates a greater appreciation for the natural world. So what happened when COVID hit and what changes happened with environmental education? These practices adopted three major types of experiences, which emerged at a global level. The first being active learning and direct experiences of nature. This is when the learner was active outdoors and took advantage of opportunities offered by nature. Examples of this include task set, whereby learners photograph or take part in nature treasure hunts, listen, watch and record birds in their back gardens, and the link between the learner and the natural world through this interaction still existed and action could be taken for the protection of our migratory birds. The second practice that emerged was active learning with indirect experiences of nature, where learning is happening in the home space and learners use technology or online platforms for knowledge inquiry without having any direct engagement with environments. And this took the form of puzzle solving or building bird boxes. The third practice that emerged was passive learning with indirect experiences of nature. This is mainly where technology and online platforms completely ruled up this experience. The learner is passive and views natural phenomena like migration online in the form of videos and online lectures. Of these three learning experiences that emerged on the onset of COVID, 47% of EE practitioners use passive learning and indirect experiences initially. And as COVID moved through the, the world, there was a 50-50% split between active learning with direct and indirect experiences. After a year of all these restrictions, it's been seen to have evened out a little bit more. And some countries are now able to move around and outside in nature. But under COVID restrictions, e-pedagogy and using online platforms definitely played an enormous role in ensuring that environmental education continued in a very different format. And made, this major shift allowed for nature to move into a classroom or home environment and thus continuing experiential learning. Yes, we had to be creative in our thinking and flexible in our implementation along the way, and I can vouch for the skills that we all had to develop to make this happen. The world suddenly opened up a little more and access to international materials were more readily available as we all adjusted to the situation. Through these connections with other practitioners, maybe which would not have happened if it had not been for COVID. However, we now stand on the other side where we have lost the physical connection to our learners and the experiences in the natural world. We need to, when moving forward, find that delicate balance between technology and access to nature. Looking at the Spring Alive program, and Louisa did bring this in, the, the sort of things that were scheduled for 2020 with our participating countries. These were planned face-to-face -face programs, teaching aids, materials, birding outings, big events, workshops, coordinated birding trips, group events, and even conferences. But this wasn't possible anymore with COVID on our shoulders. So how were we still able to meet these objectives and keep our audiences and learners tuned in? There was quite a lot of creative thinking that came about. One of these was setting weekly challenges for learners to complete, 
encouraging and guiding them to learn more about the amazing phenomena of migration. There were online teachings and lectures with the opportunity to, to interact with coordinators, encouraging learners to develop their birding craft, developing resources such as YouTube videos that carried the message of our avian migrators across the world, and creating the opportunity for anyone anywhere and under any COVID regulation to still be part of a world where migration kept us enthralled and connected when we needed it the most. Motivating learners not only to lose hope that tomorrow would come, although it might be packaged a little differently, we needed to focus on the now and the value that the world of birds gave us as a sign of hope. In South Africa, once COVID restrictions lifted slightly, we were able to take many of our resources that we had developed during the season um, to, to our community little by little. One of these, and Louisa brought it in, was our Chasing Migration board game, which tracks the migration of our mascot species of spring alive from the north to the south, while facing challenges along the way. We also developed a Kamishibai story, which is a Japanese art form of storytelling with moving pictures. And here we focused on and added a few puppets of the common ringed plover. This was also recorded and available for download for our viewers. BirdLife South Africa also com compiled a citizen science program using an app where we, community members were able to um, sorry, to log migratory species as they moved through their communities. In South Africa, we can definitely recommend that during COVID, our social media presence and, and posts worked really well under the COVID restrictions and allowed us to reach that many more learners, adults and community members. We also found that webinars on a weekly basis and scheduled with our various groups brought in those communities that we otherwise would have, had, have lost touch with. Making our resources available in electronic format for download encouraged teachers to continue with the Spring Alive program and the environmental education learning. Although COVID brought many challenges for environmental education practitioners, we rose to the occasion, adapted to the situation, and were able to reach thousands of children and adults across the globe, bringing the message and the plight of migratory birds to the fore. Thank you. That was fabulous, Christy. Thank you so much. Um, all right, before we move on to the question and answer, and thank you so much to some of you who have already posted some really interesting questions. Uh, let me acknowledge that we have people from Lesotho, Sweden, Nepal, Saudi, the Czech Republic, Jordan, Australia, Italy, England, Germany, Lebanon, the US. Um, it's lovely to have so many of you uh, from all over the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, all of the extraordinary work that you have heard from all these fantastic speakers is possible only because you are able to help us. So before we go into the question and answer uh, session, just let me put this very quickly in front of you. We are running an, a global appeal to end the illegal killing of birds. Uh, thanks to the incredible support of three anonymous donors, we are able to double your donation. So if you go to www.donorbox.org slash IKB, so illegal killing of birds, and you help us, we will be able to do a lot more, not only stopping the dreadful practices like the lime stick that you're seeing on the picture, but also helping and, and enabling children to love and experience birds um, so that they can have that values, that connection, that contact that Sarah and Christy and Louisa and Jigmi are, were, were mentioning today. All right. So let's move on to the question and answer session. And let me stop sharing this so I, you guys all can see. And, and speakers, can I ask you guys to bring up your cameras uh, so we can get into it? Um, let me start with George. George, thank you so much for the for, uh, for the message about the 
um, was it the Swift and the House Martin that were translocated in that presentation? Um, so George is asking, undergrounding power lines is often resisted because of the extra cost. How many kilometers of line were you able to get underground in Bhutan, uh, Jigmi, for the black neck cranes? It would be worth sharing this experience globally in case it could be replicated at other sites where migratory species congregate around high risk power lines. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George, for this important and very, uh, I mean, which is important for, like Patricia mentioned, you know, other um, partners can uh, see to replicate in their areas. Like, uh, of course, uh, there were you know, restrictions like uh, due to the cost, of course, it is, it, uh, uh, the cost is like three times, um, you know, uh, overhead if you put uh, underground. So, uh, until 2009, uh, people there, they were using either solar uh, lighting systems or uh, pine resins or kerosene, which were very uh, uh, bad for the health of the people there. And then, uh, but uh, somehow uh, we lobbied uh, the government and then uh, through partial uh, support uh, from uh, financial support from Australian government, uh, we uh, uh, laid the electric uh, cable lines about uh, 50 kilometers uh, of uh, lines underground. Uh, and those, uh, we also have overhead, but those are uh, along the tree lines where, you know, uh, where the black neck cranes uh, do not, uh, you know, uh, have it uh, good, good to those areas. So, yeah. Uh, but um, also, like, uh, we... Uh, for those uh, already, uh, uh, those areas where we have uh, overhead lines, we mark them with uh, uh, flight diverters. Uh, we have done that in two areas and uh, we are hoping to uh, do that marking of the overhead power lines in other areas as well. I don't know if I have answered. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it is very important to think about sharing this with other countries uh, to showcase how, you know, cost effective it can be um, and how important it is to prevent the collision of migratory birds like the cranes. Uh, so great point. Thank you so much, Ikmi, and thanks so much, George, for the question. Um, let's move on to uh, Spring Alive and languages. Um, Luisa, you were typing the answer, but can can we uh, help Tana from Portugal? Uh, I know, I know that Spring Alive is in more than my, it has more languages than just English. But can you, can you elaborate a little bit, please? Okay. Hello, Please. Tana. Yes. So um, actually, if if you go on the website, if you go on the Spring Alive website, um, you will find the resource materials available. So aside um, English, you can find some in Spanish, you can find some in French, um, and then a few of the other languages around. I think you can even find Chinese and Japanese as well. I'm not too sure, but it doesn't come with all the resource materials, but then with some, I think the ones that run most are the English and then French. But then um, if, 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 um, a country is interested, it can always be translated. If, if you don't find a translation on their website with a resource, it can always be translated and forwarded to, to you. Thank you, Louisa. <laughs> and Tana, just so you know, this is one of those programs that Jordan has started so many years ago. I think Spring Alive has been at least 10 years around and it has grown. Yeah. It is one of these programs that we definitely have to bring over the other regions and make it even bigger because it's such a wonderful resource. Uh, we are in the process of looking for additional resources to upgrade the, the platform because the platform is a little bit outdated right now. But it's, it's one of those programs that brings people together, uh, brings children together. It, it actually even became the education curriculum in countries like Zambia, for example, where the Minister of the Environment adopted Spring Alive as one of the elements of their environmental education program. Um, so it's it's an extraordinary uh, initiative and it's one that I hope that we can bring in more resources 
so we can continue to expand it and, and make it go beyond the Africa Eurasia flyway into the other flyways as well. Um, all right, let me move into Inta's question. Um, environmental education mainly for children or should it actually go to adults as well? Uh, Christy, why don't you take that one? Oh gosh, this is a question that often comes up. <laughs> um, and I think Sarah, maybe if I leave anything else, you can jump in there. I think, you know, when you're developing environmental education programs for, for children, there's, there's definitely different phases that you would align activities to and how much information you put through. And as you go up in the ages, obviously that would add in complexity um, in activities and information as well. So yes, environmental education for adults, yes. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a one shoe fits all in, in, in the environmental education arena. So let me introduce something and then we'll bring in Sarah. Um, so from our own Sarah, proud, uh, how do we prevent uh, those that are already um, uh, in favor of conservation uh, be part of these systems, especially when we're not talking about reaching out through schools and, and, and we're working with clubs like Christy has been working. Uh, Sarah, maybe you want to weave that in, in, uh, in addition to the adult um, uh, education element. Yes, for sure. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. How do we engage people who are not in the conservation sphere? And I think it come, you go back to why is environmental education beneficial? And it's not just about nature conservation. It has huge benefits for our mental health. Um, children who spend time outdoors can actually improve their academic attainments. It makes them friendlier, more socially inclusive. So there's so many different benefits that spending outdoors can bring. It's not just about conservation, although conservation is obviously uh, one of our main end goals. So I guess the way that I would tackle engaging other people is to find out what's important to them, what are their core values, what, what do they want to achieve through this program and tailor make those programs to. So that's how I would, I would answer that question. Um, and also about adults as well. Yeah, Christy is absolutely right. Any age can participate in environmental education. We talk a lot about children. That's because, as I said at the start, it's the best age to, to kind of really <laughs> instill those environmental values because they're going to be much more likely to take them on board, you know, very easily. But as you know, adults who've been through that process are going to engage with environmental education anyway, perhaps. And there's lots of different ways to get involved. It's not just playing games or colouring in or those sorts of activities. It can be conservation work. It can be going out to nature reserves and you know planting trees. There's so many different aspects of environmental education that can be tailor-made to any age group. So I hope that answers your questions. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Christy. Um, all right, so there's a very interesting question from Chris about the difference in effectiveness between uh, direct experience and indirect experience. Um, and I know, uh, I know for a fact that Spring Alive, uh, the communities in the countries where we work with Spring Alive, the communities of the parents of the children in the schools that are part of Spring Alive, have became a lot more engaged because they have been part of the activities. So do we know the difference? Have we evaluated the difference between uh, direct and indirect experience? Maybe we can start with the fantastic festivals in Bhutan and then talk a little bit more about what, um, Christy, you were talking about in terms of, of online um, experiences. And Louisa, maybe you want to chime in, chime in as well. Jigmi, can we start with you? Yeah, uh, thank you, <laughs> Chris, uh, for the question. And then uh, definitely uh, there will be, uh, I think, a difference in you know the effectiveness. Of course, we haven't uh, evaluated you know the the, the effectiveness, but uh, the, the the from the experience, um, you know, on on uh, uh, the indirect and. Uh, Direct experience, of course, you know the black neck cranes that uh, Patricia mentioned. You know that's one of the one of the ways uh, that uh, 
you know, people to engage people, uh, all all uh, generations, like uh, young, not only the kids but uh, the the uh, other uh, older adults as well. So people, you know, and in Pobjika Valley, that valley, uh, that festival marks the end of the the all the festivals in the valley. So. They do come there, and then during those sessions, they we only talk about black cranes, migratory birds, environment. So definitely, you know, people are get more aware about their surroundings, and uh, also to add, like uh, through our membership programs, uh, our members are of course mostly adults, uh, office going people, and uh, we during the weekends uh, we organize uh, nature excursions. You know, uh, talking about we have range of people. You know from different backgrounds, engineers or you know, some working in financial institutions. So when they are engaged in such uh, events, um, they do have uh, you know, more uh, uh, learning experiences. <laughs> That's all from my side. Yeah. Thank you, Jigni. Louisa, you want to jump in? OK. Um, so uh, like Jigni mentioned, we haven't really evaluated uh, the impact of direct and indirect um, observations or interactions. But um, one thing that we do over here in Ghana is try as much as possible to put out events on our social media platforms and on our website. And then I think uh, membership is also a great platform to get um, uh, people who are not environmentalists to, to take part in our programs and our activities. And one thing that we also do monthly on the first Saturday of every month is bed walks, where we get families to participate and then they come with their children. And most of these families are not really people who are environmentalists, but people who actually want their kids to also show an interest for, for, for nature. So I think um, membership is one, one great platform or one initiative that is actually drawing people for, for, for nature, be it an environmentalist or um, someone who is not so, um, who is not an expert in, uh, in, in the environment. So I think uh, aside that it's also, it's where the bed walks and activities that we organize are also opportunities to get volunteers involved. Um, and these volunteers usually also come with their children. And I think um, that is the way to go. So if, if we put more effort into membership, get more people to, to join our, our, our membership scheme, then uh, we can actually get uh, our children who are not actually in the wildlife schools or eco clubs to also participate in, in nature activities. Yeah. Great, thank you. Christy. Sure. That, I, I knew this question was going to come up. <laughs> so thank you for it. Um, in, in terms of COVID's um, impact on uh, direct and indirect experiences, obviously, as everyone has said, we haven't measured that and, and you know, put it down to the numbers. But there definitely has been a slight decrease in the, the number of children participating in indirect experiences most definitely we can acknowledge that. Um, and obviously, you know, from an, an education perspective, learning about the environment, in the environment and for the environment is so much more fun than with a group of people than trying to do it by yourself. Um, and what we often find is that that just fuels the interest um, for taking action uh, in the natural environment. And that's enthusiasm that children go home with, with the excitement and the enjoyment is kind of infectious with the parents. And I think that's where Louisa is saying, you start getting parents becoming members of bird life partners and things like that. But to nail it down to numbers at this point, we can't really, really say how COVID has impacted that indirect experience. Great. Sarah, anything to add? Yeah, just a short point, I guess, just adding on from that. Um, I think in terms of environmental education, learning about it 
um, can be done very easily indirectly. You know, there's so many great ways that we can run workshops and there's videos and there's e-learning tools. So that, that can be done. The part that you're missing from the online learning is the caring part, the connection part and the experiencing part. And that's what's going to change those behaviors. So that's the real challenge we've had with COVID. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that small point. I think this, it's, it's a small point that is a very important point. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, all right, let me, let me move on to two questions that I have on my own and um, until we keep having more questions from the audience. Um, and let's talk about money um, for environmental education. And I, I want to take on, um, and Luisa said it very well, thank you so much, Heidelberg Cement. Uh, for trusting and in, in, in supporting um, Spring Alive. Um, you know, as, 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 uh, as many of us working in the conservation sector, we are always trying to get more funding for um, our different projects. And one of the biggest challenges of funding these type of projects that are related to education is that normally the conservation donors want to see the conservation impact and how many birds have we saved by training all of these children or working with all of these families or engaging with all of these people in, this, this, in these festivals. And it's really hard to show that direct impact on the conservation. And when you go to education donors, then we are a conservation organization. So we are not necessarily accredited or qualified as an education uh, charity. And, and we often fall in this crack of donor interest. Um, I'm wondering if you guys have some wisdom about how to go about this. Um, it is, it has been a challenge. Um, but I think it is, it's absolutely an investment for the future. If we don't have this happening right now, and someone was saying it, uh, uh, Sulfikar was saying, we have to educate the future leaders um, with this sense of development. Um, and, and environment so then the, the impact of projects in the future are not going to be as extreme as they are right now um so how do we how do we bridge this gap between um, believing and trusting and absolutely being convinced of the role that education plays and um what we are seeing not necessarily huge interest of the donor community on putting money on this um who wants to start I know that this is a difficult one. <laughs> Sarah. I can start us off on this one. It's a great question. Um, I guess I'm just speaking from my experience here. Maybe others have other things to contribute. Um, but in looking for funding for environmental education, the great thing about environmental education is it's so flexible. It fits into so many different things. Like I was saying, you could do a whole project on mental health, find a donor that's interested in mental health and explain why environmental education is going to lead them to achieving their mental health outcomes, you know? Or go into education. Why is it important that we reach out to perhaps children from fewer opportunities or children from different backgrounds or those sorts of things? Environmental education has the answer. So the good thing about that is that you can fit it in and you're still doing exactly the same activities. You're still having the same conservation outcomes, um, but you're able to answer so many different donors um, you know, what they're looking for in a funding application. And so I've done that a lot through the European funding with Erasmus Plus. Their priorities are mainly about education and training, yet we've done, and a lot of the European BirdLife partners have got so much funding from this because they've used that approach. Yeah, true, very good. Who else wants to chime in? Take me. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, just to echo what, uh, whatever Sarah uh, mentioned, it's, yes, it's a, it's a cross-cutting, you know, environmental education, it's a cross-cutting uh, program in, you know, all the, all the programs that we uh, uh, implement here. And uh, we integrate uh, e in, in all our projects, actually, you know, we have uh, one component uh, of EE in, in each each of our projects that we implement here. Of course, uh, uh, it's if you have like environmental education as a one, you know, uh, uh, separate, it, it is quite difficult to, to uh, get, you know, support uh, in terms of financial support. 
but uh, integrating into other uh, programs, other uh, projects, uh, that way we, we have been doing that. So I don't know if that's helping you. I mean, my answer. It always helps me. <laughs> Christy or Luisa, Christy. Yeah, thanks, Patricia. I, I think I, I can only but echo Sarah and Jigme as well. I, I think it really comes down to how you package a program um, to, to meet the needs or, or the requests of a potential funder. Um, and, and we've kind of, we found in South Africa that aligning with departments of education and having endorsements uh, from departments, particularly surrounding the curriculum, um, it really helps in, in, in that matter. Um, if you can link to what's already existing in a school and build up on that and your, your potential is a lot bigger there. Agree, absolutely. Luisa? Yes, um, so what I'd like to add is uh, like Jigme mentioned, um, there's actually restricted funding when it comes to environmental education. So um, what we also try to do is have a component of environmental education in every proposal that we send out there. But one thing that we also do over here is try to incorporate whatever we are doing. I mean, in terms of uh, seeking funding from local organizations or local businesses, is uh, trying to fuse this into the national agenda. So if, 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 if there's a national agenda goal on environmental education or an educational agenda nationally, this is how we get the corporate, I mean the businesses in Ghana to actually uh, contribute to environmental education. And one thing that we also do is try to approach, apart from international donors, when it comes to local um, um, donors, what we do is trying to get to people who whose direct operations affect biodiversity or affect the behavior of children in their operational areas, like we do with um, GASEM. So GASEM is the subsidiary for Hedenberg Cement, where uh, you, are, you can actually tie in the link to mining with the impact it will have on, 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 on the communities, around, the fringe communities around and getting them to actually contribute to educating the young ones around about um, biodiversity and how it impacts on, 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 on the climate. So I think that is one angle that we can also look at because currently there are so many uh, conservation NGOs and we are all looking to the same donors uh, internationally. So I think right now we should also think about um, spreading our wings to local uh, businesses and then um, once they are local businesses that identifies with the national goals, they, they are more willing to, to support with the, the conservation outcomes, yeah. I absolutely agree, yeah. Luisa. Thank you so much for that. This is extraordinary. Okay, I want to jump into another, um, oh, Julius bit me. <laughs> uh, so let's tackle Julius and then we'll come in with my, my last question. Um, so Julie is saying, to what extent is traditional and indigenous knowledge integrated in environmental education? And does this help in terms of understanding nature and changing behaviors? I want to start with Jigme. Um, how much have you incorporated traditional and indigenous knowledge? I know that a lot of Buddhist uh, practices uh, involve cranes and, you know, like the, the cranes are revered. Uh, so. How are you bringing that up in, in, the, in, the, in the work? Yeah, thank you, uh, Julius. As I mentioned in my presentation, you know, uh, uh, traditionally, uh, the way of life uh, living uh, in, um, of the people here in Bhutan, we have these respects, uh, you know, beliefs and respects for the nature. We have, uh, you know, uh, rivers or trees or even sometimes a rock is being uh, uh, revered as something holy or so bringing those uh, uh, traditional you know beliefs and knowledge we do integrate in our uh, ee uh, uh, programs and uh, this definitely uh, helps in you know 
the young uh, modernizing young you know uh, Bhutanese uh, who has access to all this information about uh, developments and all those things, but uh, keeping the roots, you know, the of our beliefs, we integrate uh, those traditional knowledge in our EE programs so that the kids, you know, are, although they have this knowledge, you know, the global knowledge, they, but deep down they are rooted, you know, uh, with these uh, beliefs and, yeah. Uh <laughs> Yeah. Christy? Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button there quickly. I, I totally agree. And I think, um, you, you know, in environmental education, traditional knowledge or traditional knowledge systems underpins everything. And it's really, as Jigmi's saying, is working from the known um, and what's traditional and moving that forward into the unknown. So it really plays a huge part um, um, in, in all our education programs, at least here in South Africa. Um, and it's, it's always interesting to, as you move around, to hear different, slightly different takes on traditional stories about particular birds and things like that. And hopefully, maybe at one point, Spring Alive, we can put together a book on traditional stories from across the world on all our migratory species. So maybe I'm putting a challenge out there. <laughs> no, that, that's a fantastic idea. Louisa, you wanna share your views on, on, on traditional and indigenous knowledge? Yeah, um, so just something short. Um, like uh, Christy mentioned, um, traditional knowledge is something that we integrate into environmental education with our school children and um, um, trust me, um, when the traditional knowledge is integrated into environmental education, it's much easier for kids to understand where you are coming from and where you wish to go. And uh, when you talk about stories, proverbs, totems, they identify with these totems, with these festivals, and then with the stories. And the, the message sinks deeper than when uh, you do not include all these indigenous language in your education. So I think it's one way to go and uh, we can look at that. All right, so I'm gonna throw one next one. Um, so one of the things that I love so much about the work that you guys do is that you are really cultivating the values of the future. Um, and it's these children who are actually capturing all of this extraordinary knowledge about the wonder of the migration and what do we need to do, but they're also fighting tradition in some in some countries. Um, whether it is because their families are hunters or because their families are used to practices of, you know, um, capturing small um, migrant birds and roasting them on the barbecue, um, or you know, lime sticks as we saw in the picture. Uh, so. I truly believe that children are agents of change. And I love the ed education, environmental education program because of that. But how do, you, how do we manage that tradition? And how, do we, you, how, do, how can we really build up on that, creating those values of the future so they can help us change those traditions that may be jeopardizing the future of these birds um, and, and the future of the flyaways? I know it's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? Last round, I promise. <laughs> start off with a comment if that gets us going. Um, so yeah, this, that is a very, very difficult question. So saying that when you connect children to nature, there are sort of different values that we might get from that. So their experiences that they're having, maybe they connect to nature through hunting and that's how we get generations of hunters because they've connected to nature in that way. And that's maybe not the way that we want to be promoting. So it's about finding ways to help children connect to nature in a much more positive environment. And that's gonna give them the values of conservation and protecting nature, if that makes sense exactly. So that's where I would start from. And also what we're seeing, um, you know, as, as you said at the start, I've worked with birds. I've also for the past five years where hunting is obviously a big issue there. And we're seeing this over generations. I've spoken to many young people who, whose parents are hunters, but they are not. 
And it's sort of, they have different values and they're coming from different places, from their schools, from maybe their peers, and they're getting influenced that way rather than perhaps through what their parents are doing. And then in fact, they in turn are influencing their parents. So I hope that answers part of your question at least. <laughs> Okay, who else wants to jump in? I know that this is a hard one and it's hard to come to terms. Christy. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm not taking the shortcut out of this, but I, I totally agree, agree with Sarah. It's, it's creating those spaces where value is attached to conservation and sustainability um, and, and really bringing that to the fore and allowing children and young adults the space to have their own views, uh, whether that's completely different to their parents, um, but, but being able to stand on their own two feet and, and have their own opinion um, on how to move forward. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. All right, anyone else? <laughs> no? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I totally agree with uh, Sarah and then Christy. So um, it's not really something difficult to, to engage kids in, in, in environmental education. I mean, when it comes to um, situations like this, I think um, it, it's it, like um, Sarah mentioned, um, parents come from somewhere and then the kids are also um, mingle with students from different walks of life and their values are different they are quite different values so um and we are in the technological age people are learning kids are learning a lot from other countries and it's also influenced their their values on conservation as compared to 30 years back when we didn't have digital uh, medium and all that so i think uh, it's, it's actually positive and um, we are hoping for the better. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we are almost at the end of our time. Uh, I just want to put up this um, slide one more time to entice you. Thank you so much to those of you who already have donated. We have seen a couple of you uh, going into donor box and, and, and helping us. We cannot do any of this fantastic work without your support. And thanks to these three donors, if you donate today, we will be able to double your donation. So visit the website, Sarah kindly put it on the, on the Q&A, share it with your friends, help us out, help us help these extraordinary partners of the BirdLife family to stop the illegal killing of birds. Um, they already are uh, facing a lot of other trouble uh, we should not be exacerbating it with uh, killing them right, left, and center. Um, and I would like to take the time to thank my four fabulous speakers. Uh, it's been lovely to have all of you. Um, it's it's so refreshing and wonderful to hear about Spring Alive and the extraordinary work that you guys are doing in Bhutan. Uh, thank you so much for keeping it up. Um, it is our birds needed, our nature needed, our planet needed, um, and we couldn't be doing it without you guys. So thanks again. Thanks again to all of you who have joined us from all over the world. We are going to have um, a new webinars. Uh, we have one of the Americas being led by the Americas tomorrow um, at 5 p.m. UK, 9 a.m. Pacific um, on um, the Fraser River estuary. Uh, remember that uh, this Saturday is World Migratory Bird Day. Uh, join us. There's a series of activities and I know that um, Miguel uh, put the link of what um, the Latin America Global um, Migratory Bird Day um, Coordination Group is doing. We are going to have a global birding weekend. Join us, join, uh, join the teams, uh, come and go birding with us. Uh, in the fall last year, we had over 37,000 birders around the world in more than 112 countries. Uh, let's break that record this time. Um, join us and, and let's let's um, let's uh, keep the world connected through birds and through the migration. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, the four of you. You have been stellar speakers. Um, I love the work that you guys do. It's such a pleasure and an honor to show and represent you guys here. Um, and keep in touch. We will have new webinars um, and share the donor box link with your friends and family so we can keep uh, pushing to stop the legal killing of birds. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing and
but we'll thank everybody. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Billy, for organizing all of this. It has been lovely to see it.